Well, as I've been sitting here listening to uh, a great deal of heart's wisdom from all three of these uh, speakers, I've been tempted to throw away my <laughs> three pages of well-prepared, well-thought-through remarks. And I think I'm going to do that and keep this brief. Uh, I captioned this slow violence, uh, thinking of the context in which we're asked to speak. I think creating a climate for peace was the caption of the evening. The images of slow violence as I thought about it were things like uh, the leaf by leaf, stem by stem, wilting in Syria in its worst drought in 900 years that led to the depopulation of the farms and people family by family, one after another and another, beginning to fill the cities and the cities unable to cope and protests arising, forcefully put down and a terrible war with many factions breaking out, sheer chaos. That was an image. But the slow violence of the drought uh, that preceded it was what I focused on. Just two weeks ago, I read in the New York Times uh, that uh, uh, the sea level uh, has been rising faster than uh, at any time in 28 centuries since the founding of the Roman Republic, I think around 500 BC. I don't know what happened then. Uh, but that brought to mind a wonderful thing. I'm sure some of you have experienced this, standing on a main shore on a windless, calm day, and just watching, really watching, as the water almost breathes upward. In just the flash of an eye, it's suddenly an inch higher because the tide is rising. Uh, you look at ocean rise, and that becomes a slow violence because of our warming. I'm going to read uh, a section or two from what I prepared, and then I'm going to end with an, uh, two images. Uh, in the Gulf of Maine, I noted, remarkable things have been happening. Clam flats have begun to go dead. Codfish have crashed. Shrimp have vanished. Lobsters. Uh, are migrating north. The waters have been warming, warming, warming. Slow violence. And it's a violence to the natural order of things, to the fine balances and rhythms of nature. Just the other day, I was awakened in the middle of the damn night by a thunderstorm, a February thunderstorm, lightning, crashing, thunder. And Christmas Eve, I remember seeing uh, a hatch of insects dancing in the late afternoon sun. And a little bit later that same day, I had occasion to go into my art studio, and there was a dandelion popping its yellow head up out of the ground. Christmas Eve, beautiful, but in context, slow, slow violence. So here's the image one of the two that I wanted to uh, share. Lakhmagan Teak. The Lakhmagan Teak disaster involved a driverless train. Nobody steering. Nobody in control. It had been parked around 11 p.m. that night in the village of Nantes to the northwest of Lakhmagan Teak. Around 1 in the morning, sleep time for most, through a concatenation of errors, culminating in a soft, gradual letting go of the air brakes, this hulking, headlightless, dark, driverless train began slowly and inexorably rolling, rolling down a very gradual grade, 1.2% slope. Seven miles away and about 350 feet below lay the unsuspecting town. Eighteen minutes later, 
that driverless train was careening through Lac Megantique at over 60 miles per hour, sparks flying, metal screeching, completely out of control. When it derailed, with explosion after explosion, the balls of fire were three times higher than the highest of Lac Megantique's buildings. And as the oil coursed, tumbling along the ground, it poured into storm drains and burst out as huge fires further on from manholes and basements and even house chimneys. Human bodies were vaporized. Some people's remains never were found. Lac Megantique is a powerful metaphor, a lesson, for where we stand at this moment in historical time. Undeniably, though there's a whole party that denies it, this climate is changing. The Earth's climate is moving. It's beginning to accelerate toward a catastrophic and irreversible harm. But this is the point. It's not completely out of control. Not yet. We human beings still have time to catch it, to board it, to bring it under control. How? Step by step. We do it step by step. Whatever step is right for you, whether dramatic and public or unseen and private, one step will lead on to the other. You'll be shown it, and another, and another, until collectively, a collection of individual acts in freedom, a counter-momentum, not towards death and disaster, but towards life and peace and hope, begins to take effect. Indeed, it has already begun, and we can all be part of it. We can all be part of it. That's the written part. Now the second image, and I'll stop. It struck me listening to Sherry and uh, Iris and Megan, uh, words like a crisis of the heart, a spiritual crisis. I thought of Sarah and my and uh, going to the healing walk in the province of Alberta in Canada. And I had the extraordinary experience of being in a teepee with a Native American pipe ceremony. And in the middle of that pipe ceremony, uh, invoked was, it was not just speaking to the ancestors, but to the unborn, the children to be, spiritual beings in the realm we just barely cannot see, but who are there as we are there. The native wisdom knows that. So a child is born and comes into the earth. And by the way, today's children, my colleague of mine, a faculty member, just had a little guy named Gus born two weeks ago. Today's children, if we do nothing about the climate crisis, if we don't individually find that step that's right, which will lead on and show us the next step and the next, if we don't, these little young human beings are facing something perfectly dreadful where all of the stuff comes together. All of the chaos breaks out. Not just the heat, but everything that humanity is capable of. But here's the picture. Think of how we're born. We are utterly helpless. I just finished teaching a unit of, of comparative human and animal science. And it takes human beings a full year to really get their legs under them, to stand up. When we're born, we can't even lift our own head. Think of the immense trust in one's parents, one's fellow human beings, that each one of us brings into the world when we're born. It will be all right. They are here for us. And we learn to put one step in front of the other that precedes speaking. And from speaking, we learn thinking. And eventually, out of that comes the word I, the word that 
unlike any other word in the language, pertains only to something that only you can speak. So I think the climate movement is really one among many worthy movements, but it's certainly an important one. And it's so important that we find it in ourselves, what is the right step this morning, now, for me? Because the time of being passive is really past. Thanks. <laughs>